Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello, Baha'i Blogcast listeners. It's me, Rain Wilson, and uh, an extra special treat today. I've been wandering across the campus of UCLA uh, to the Humanities Building, up to the Middle Eastern Studies and Persian Studies, Iranian Studies Department to speak with uh, my good friend, uh, brilliant Baha'i scholar, Dr. Nader Saidi, who is the Baha'i Professor of Iranian cultural studies and history of the Baha'i faith in what is it? Uh, <laughs> it's a Taslimi professor of uh, Baha'i history and culture in Iran. Baha'i history and culture in Iran. Fantastic. And how long have you been teaching here at UCLA? Uh, I have been uh, at, in this position uh, four years. I mean, four years have been completed, and so we are now beginning the fifth year. But it's interesting that I started my uh, teaching uh, uh, work uh, at UCLA as well. But this is slightly more than 30 years ago. 30. You started teaching at UCLA at yes. the very, very beginning. Yes. And so uh, UCLA seems to be my alpha and omega. <laughs> Your alpha and omega. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I, Don't say but, Omega, because that, that, I picture you like keeling over uh, at the lectern in front of your students or something like that. Um, but uh, Dr. Saidi, I got to uh, visit your class last year. And um, for those of you who don't know, this is a very popular class. It, it fills up all the different um, the specific courses that you do teach here. I, I couldn't believe it. The students, there were a couple Baha'is in there, but mostly non-Baha'i students, a lot of Muslim students, some Persians, but people of all different races. And it's a very highly rated and regarded class. And it was just really exciting to see you talking about uh, Baha'i culture and history um, to, uh, you know, a good hundred really eager, eager students. Uh, it has been really an amazing experience. Uh, we came here um, um, with the idea that this is a, an important opportunity to serve the faith and serve Iran and serve the world. Uh, really, the you know my work and uh, my professional uh, experience uh, is defined as a sociologist. Uh, right now, I am employed by Iranian studies at UCLA, but uh, I have been always uh, teaching sociology for almost 30 years. I, I taught sociology in different places. And so coming to UCLA to teach uh, Baha'i studies or Baha'i studies in the context of Iran was uh, some sort of occupational change for me. And uh, the the only reason that um, my wife, Bita, and I decided to move to LA uh, and uh, <clears throat> assume this position was that we both believe that uh, this is a, a historic event and that it is important for the future of Iran and uh, it is important for uh, uh, scholarship uh, regarding to Baha'i faith. And uh, for uh, for these uh, reasons, we uh, we came here and I joined uh, the department, but I had no idea what would happen. I had no idea what would be the level of interest and curiosity about it, whether uh, the courses, because I teach three different courses. Mm -hmm. What are the three courses? Uh, in the fall, I teach a course which focuses on the history of the Baha'i faith, <clears throat> again in the context of Iran. Uh, and uh, uh, because of limitation of time, it becomes uh, mostly centered on the Bab, on Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. A little bit after that, but unfortunately, usually we are uh, out of time. Uh, the second course is about uh, Babi Baha'i scriptures. So we look at the 
Baha'i text, Baha'i writings, uh, beginning from the Bab, and then going through <coughs> writings of Baha'u'llah, writings of Abdul Baha, uh, and some writings of Shoghi Effendi and the House of Justice. But again, um, with the writings of Abdul Baha, we are almost at the end of the course. It's, I, I'm, always time is my enemy in these classes. I mean, because you talk too much. <laughs> Let's face true. it. <laughs> And the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the structure of the courses also are uh, lecture-based. Um, and uh, not only because, you know, that's my strength, uh, but also because uh, we are always uh, facing limitation of time, scarcity of time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and the third course uh, is about 20th century Iran and the Baha'i faith. So we look at 20th century Iran from the constitutional revolution of 1906 uh, in Iran to the Islamic revolution of 1979. And at the same time that we explore the uh, social and political history of Iran during this time, we look at the interaction of the Baha'i community <clears throat> and Baha'i faith with Iran of 20th century mm. in varieties of ways, positive and negative. Um, how, for instance, hostility and prejudice and persecution of the Baha'i faith has blocked the possibility of successful reform or, uh, uh, or uh, liberalization or democratization of Iran. There, there has been so many movements uh, throughout 20th century Iran for change, for reform, and a main common element that at any moment it prevented the successful uh, resolution of these issues and successful democratization was uh, this consistent uh, identification of the Baha'i faith with uh, reform mm. and the opposition of the clerics mm -hmm. uh, to uh, so you're saying that. that they go hand in hand. Reform in Iran has been kind of quelched with the oppression of the Baha'is in Iran because Baha'is and, I hate to say liberal, but more, you know, progressive modifications to democracy um, are, are synonymous. Uh, yes. And, you know, many aspects of this issue, uh, unfortunately, are not well known, uh, partly because the uh, scholarship on Iran uh, deliberately excludes um, and is silent or distorting anything related to the Baha'i faith uh, with regard to the history of Iran. And uh, even in the West, uh, because uh, academic studies of, uh, of the Middle East uh, mostly is motivated uh, by, uh, um, by what is happening outside socially and politically. So anything which is creating news in the sense of violence, in terms of terrorism, in terms of uh, revolution, things like that, <clears throat> they become worthy of academic research. Mm. But behind faith, you know, the only news that it creates is expansion of unity, expansion of communication, peace. love, yeah. peace, and so on. Grassroots so, so, exactly. education. And for that reason, uh, even in the West, when uh, relatively uh, there are little, uh, at least not explicit, prejudice uh, uh, against the Baha'i faith, uh, unfortunately, still the Baha'i faith has not been yet uh, discovered. But if you look at the history of Iran, for example, you see that uh, Baha'u'llah was the first Iranian who has talked about political democracy for decades, he was the first Iranian to talk about the political uh, democracy. Baha'i faith is the, uh, and Baha'u'llah was uh, the first person who talks about uh, uh, slavery as uh, violating the <clears throat> fundamental principle of universe and, uh, and human rights and human reality. Baha'u'llah is the first one in Iran who is uh, talking about the uh, station of women and the necessity of transformation of society in that sense. Mahal is the first Iranian who talks about a global 
uh, uh, consciousness and therefore puts the question of reform of Iran at the same time in the con context of reform of the world. And that's why the question of peace becomes so important uh, in Baha'i writings. No Iranian writer uh, uh, in 19th century or early 20th century was uh, remotely interested in the question of international peace or, or right. peace in general. So I mean, wasn't it really the secret of divine civilization that was the first yes, cutting edge work? Exactly, on that, on exactly that right. Exactly right. Now and, I heard you give a lecture on that at the LA Baha'i Center, and it's brilliant. But I, and I but I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off a little <laughs> bit because I want to go back a little bit. I want to kind of start a little bit more sure. at the beginning, and then maybe maybe we can come back around to. Um, no, I just mentioned that uh, to confirm what you mentioned that the question of reform in Iran uh, and. Uh, democratization, movement towards human rights, and so on, has been inseparable from the visions and the movement, which we call it Baha'i Faith. They mm. have been uh, organically interrelated, and, uh, and that's why the clerical opposition to reform, to a large extent, is partly because of their own you know, superstitious backward uh, uh, logic of thinking, but also it, their opposition has been motivated by the fact that culture and society identified reform as Baha'i faith. Oh, wow, that's interesting. They go hand in hand. Well, let's go back to the very beginning, because the thing I find really interesting about you, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Saidi is, is so brilliant, you could just come up with one hidden word or one phrase from the Baha'i faith, and you could just toss it to him like a softball, and he could give a brilliant lecture for an hour on that one topic. Um, I, but I'm not here to flatter you. I'm here to have a discussion with <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're um, very kind. But I like that you began your studies as a sociologist, as a, an atheist, as a Marxist, who was also obsessed with uh, the writings of Karl Marx and with Friedrich Nietzsche. So how do you go from an atheist um, studying Marx and Nietzsche to uh, a Baha'i, a devout Baha'i, and also... What lessons could Baha'is learn or people of faith learn from both Marx and Nietzsche? Um, in a sense, uh, my interest in uh, Marxist theory uh, was a product of my uh, typical uh, social role or social position. I, uh, I was in Iran and I went to university uh, in Iran, I got my bachelor's degree and master's degree in Iran. And in Iran and many of developing societies, uh, particularly during that time, now it is not as strong as it uh, used to be, but still the same pattern uh, is true, that if you are intellectual type in these societies, you, are, you should be Marxist. I mean, mm -hmm. Marxism has a lot of attraction Partly because it is illegal. For instance, when I was uh, in Iran, uh, 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 I was in the, one of the best universities, but um, the library had none of the books of Marx mm -hmm. uh, or uh, Engels and so on, none of, none of their books, um, because it was uh, illegal to, to read them and uh, to distribute them and, and so on. Um, so everything had a sense of mystery and adventure about it. It was this concealed entity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was this sense of danger and so on uh, in order to become familiar with this uh, secret that the uh, state tries it's to It's like being in a secret, secret spy club, kind of, <laughs> yes. being the secret Marxists. And at the same time, Marxist theory, you know, has a lot of attractive, uh, attractive elements, uh, a lot of sentiments, um, which is associated with Marxist theory or sentiments related to fight against the suffering of uh, masses, mm -hmm. fight against uh, extremes of inequality, fight against injustice and Oppression. so on. Yeah. Exactly. And for, for these reasons, uh, particularly if you are young, um, and I was young at, at that time, uh, these, uh, uh, these, these ideas and ideas are are very attractive. And then, of course, uh, although when I was in Iran, I really didn't know uh, very uh, accurately um, the ideas of Marx and Engels. I mean, I knew some, 
but later on I discovered that my perception and my knowledge and so on was not really uh, sophisticated. Um, but uh, as a social theory, as a uh, as a as an explanation of history and society and so on, also Marxist theory is is a very attractive theory, and it's not one theory which uh, talks about one little aspect of life, but rather like religion. Mm-hmm. It provides a holistic definition and interpretation of the entire human history. It's all encompassing. Exactly. It has an economic philosophy, but it also has a sociological one. It's got, everything can be explained. You can kind of plug it into Marxism and it can be yes. explained. It was one of the first systems like that, right? I mean, you had some philosophical systems, but they didn't embrace economics and social movements. Uh, in the past, you know, intellectuals were not that specialized. And so uh, in general, when you go uh, to the more distant past, uh, it was more likely that intellectuals would have something to say about almost everything. Uh, but uh, with the emergence of the modern science and modern scholarship and so on, everything has started to become specialized. And so, particularly right now, universities are defined this way. People are specialized about one little aspect of life and universe, uh-huh. and it is not connected to anything else. And that, of course, creates crisis of meaning and this longing and thirst for meaning, for in, in interconnections and so on. And Marxist theory is one of uh, these rare uh, theories, uh, uh, like, for instance, Hegel's philosophy, which was also like that prior mm-hmm. to Marxist theory that uh, tries to bring a sense of meaning. In fact, sociology uh, came into existence with the assumption that sociology is supposed to connect all different specialized disciplines and interpret them in a holistic fashion. The so-called founder of uh, sociology, his name is August Kant, and this was exactly his point, that sociology was supposed to be not a a specialized study of a particular aspect of society, like economics, which deals with economic relations, or Mm -hmm. politics, uh, which relates to a state and so on, or literature, which, you know, or religion or something like that, but uh, religion uh, meaning religious studies, but rather to bring all of them together, unify them, discover common laws of universe, and discuss that. Sociology was supposed to be that way. And of course, very soon, sociology also uh, became another specialized discipline and so forgot its original uh, purpose and meaning. But Marxist theory never was, never forgot that. And Marxist theory, really its uh, role has been like a religion, mm-hmm. that it gives a general interpretation of universe and the self and the location of the self within this universe and for that reason, both of them, namely religion and Marxist theory, not only they describe reality, describe history, but also they make value judgment and they bring a sense of what is good, what is bad, what is evil, uh, 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 what is just, and um, and create, <clears throat> therefore, a, a political, moral, normative orientation that one has to act in that way. Uh, scholarship in general normally makes a distinction between values and facts, and they are supposed to be concentrating on facts right. and make value judgment. Uh, you know, so some, Marx had, had an essential value judgment, which is oppression of the worker is a bad thing. Yes, this is why it happens. Exactly. It causes injustice, and you must fight that injustice by doing X, Y, and Z. Yes. But that's not necessarily a science because it is including a value judgment in the philosophy itself. Uh, That is completely true. However, in his thinking, um, in a sense, he reduced values to facts. So many times it becomes, so for example, he rejects, uh, as you said, oppression in society, but he defines it as exploitation. Mm -hmm. But then he defines exploitation as an economic fact. Namely, according to his theory, if I have worked 
and I have uh, produced uh, a surplus and you have not worked. But now because of some social arrangement like legal ownership of the means of production, you become entitled to own the surplus which is produced by me. It's not produced by you, but because of your title, without producing it, you appropriate it, you take it. Mm -hmm. So Marx calls this exploitation, and this becomes injustice and oppression. So the whole theory of oppression and injustice and so on supposedly is rooted in a scientific, objective right. expression of, uh, of fact. looking at ownership. And, and of course, this becomes, you know, sometimes uh, one of the main uh, problems of Marxist theory. Um, increasingly, people who identify themselves with Marxist theory in varieties of fashion, um, they ultimately think that the way to improve society and to discover what to be done is through scientific knowledge. But of course, this, this is Marxist scientific knowledge, not other types of knowledge. And so it turns into an elitistic theory, which assumes that the masses of the people, they are in false consciousness. They cannot understand what is good for them because they don't know the objective facts or realities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they don't have class consciousness. But a Marxist intellectual or a Marxist uh, member of the party, which later on it becomes uh, in, uh, in Soviet Union and so on, becomes uh, party officials and so on. These are the people who can tell others what is good for them. Uh -huh. And therefore, th this they reduction... Become a, they become a clergy almost. Exactly, you're right. And uh, so looking down at the masses of the people, they, they usually give very uh, lofty slogans about the people and the necessity of power of the people and participation of people and democracy and so on. But in reality, they look at, at the people, the actual people, the living people, as people who are brainwashed by mm -hmm. ideologies and therefore incapable of thinking for themselves. And therefore, these elites, intellectuals, uh, have to make decisions for them. And so exactly like the clerics. Uh, it's a they, different kind of oppression then. Exactly. The, the result Created is that class. it becomes op opposed to democratization and mm -hmm. opposed to the rights of the... And so it moves increasingly towards a situation that every aspect of the society has to be controlled, determined by these elites. Right. And so that becomes, uh, as you said, increasingly one totalitarian society in which freedom or people's rights and so on become irrelevant. So the intention is beautiful, but for varieties of reasons, and this was just one of them, the relation yes. of facts and values, it becomes uh, sometimes the exact opposite of that. Well, we could, I'd love to spend an hour talking about Marxism with you, but I'm tr what's the transition for you? You're a student in the 70s, in 80s, in, in Iran, and then you come to the United States. How do you make a transition from a Marxist scholar who loves Nietzsche to, um, to, to Baha'i? Um, I was uh, um, sympathetic uh, and identifying myself to a large extent with Marxism uh, when I was in Iran. But at the same time, I, uh, I had these inner spiritual struggles in Iran. And so I wouldn't define myself completely as a Marxist, but uh, I had ups and downs. But when I came to the US, and uh, this is 1979. Um, at that time... You came before the revolution. Uh, I came uh, just a few months after the revolution. Okay. So in order, for, to, in order to come to Iran, I had to go to England to get visa because U.S. embassy at this time uh, would not give uh, visas to Iranians. So I had to come to... I had to go to... London and from uh, London, I, I get. Uh, so in uh, April, it was April of 79 when I came to the United States. And my purpose, of course, was to, to study uh, and get my PhD and then go back to Iran to be able to be of some services in Iran. But what uh, happened uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, a lot of things happened, but one of them re regarding my own intellectual, uh, spiritual uh, development uh, was that um, being far from the community that I was used to it, um, I became purely Marxist. Okay. And so for a number of years, the only way that I would identify myself was, was uh, Marxist. And at this time, uh, I would not define uh, life or my own identity in any way which would be a spiritual. Okay. So I was atheist. Uh, I remember in the little room that I had, um, uh, at first, you know, it was economically very difficult for me. Um, but in the little room that I had, I had the picture of Marx and I had the picture of Lenin <laughs> on my walls. <laughs> and uh, very soon, because I really studied the writings of Marx and Engels, I mean, I read everything they have written. Um, I, I came to, uh, to have a different uh, viewpoint. Namely, I found a lot of ideas of Marx as... Uh, as uh, positive and beautiful, but at the same time, I noted that there are lots of problems mm -hmm. with this theory. And mm -hmm. so uh, that uh, deified picture of, of, of uh, first Lenin came down. I mean, Lenin, yeah. I saw that. It's just too flawed right off the bat. And uh, too authoritarian, too uh, democracy and human rights and human equality, dignity of all humans have always been important principles for me. I mm -hmm. mean, that was my sentiment. And I could see that uh, Lenin and what he stood for and so on wouldn't, wouldn't fit that. And after a few marks, Marx also came down. But still, I identified myself with a, some sort of Western Marxism, namely a, some sort of democratic interpretation flexible interpretation of Marxism, which would not be obsessed with the details of ideas, but more with the general principles sure. and concepts and, and so on. And uh, it was at this time that I, uh, because I was familiar with uh, Baha'i faith, I, I come from a Baha'i family. I had studied the Baha'i writings when I was very young. But uh, then during these times, I had become an atheist, and so I had no interest. Um, but during this time, I uh, sort of accidentally uh, read two of the Baha'i writings. You One, accidentally read them? Yes. No, I had read, <laughs> of course, these works in the past. Yes. The problem was that the way I read these works was on the basis, I looked at these works from uh, through the eyes of others. Mm -hmm. through the eyes of other Baha'is who had classes or who, who would give lectures and th things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Namely, exactly what the opposite of what Baha'u'llah says. Baha'u'llah says that you have to look at things through the, your own eyes, not through eyes of my servants. Mm -hmm. And the whole, I mean, the whole hidden words, the whole seven valleys, the whole book of certitude, um, the, 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 the central message of all these works is that you as an individual, you are the image of God. God has created you rational. God is present in your heart. You can and you should, and you, you have the responsibility to think for yourself, to doubt about everything, yep. and uh, to ignore whatever you have been told by society, by parents, by clerics by prejudices of society and so on. And it is at that time that you can understand, you can have approach to the truth. Um, since I didn't understand any of these things in the writings, because I looked at the writings through the habitual ways that people around me would understand their Baha'i writings, for these reasons, I, I didn't understand the relevance of the Baha'i faith or the sophistication hmm. of the Baha'i writings. So what did you read in this new way, seeing it through your own eyes? And during this time, I read one was the Book of Certitude yep. of Baha'u'llah, and one was the Secret of Divine Civilization of Abdul Baha that you mm -hmm. mentioned. And I could not believe myself because this time, you know, I, I was an atheist and I had completely rejected 
Baha'i faith and uh, I mean, I love Baha'is and Baha'i faith in general, the ideas of peace, unity and so on. I sure. had so much respect for, for the community and for the faith, but intellectually, I didn't take it seriously. And I didn't think that it, it has anything really to, uh, to contribute. What was important for me, on the other hand, was, for instance, Marx and Hegel or social theory in general. And, and, you know, for me, these were sophisticated things. And now I read these works and I could not believe what I was reading. I had read these books before. Yeah. But then now I noted that the things that they are discussing are completely different from what I had assumed that mm. these books would, would mm. talk about. For instance, Secret of Divine Civilization, immediately I noted is a theory, is a discourse on the question of socioeconomic development mm. and uh, how Iran and other societies and, uh, and so on can move towards uh, social, uh, economic, cultural, political development and progress and so on, um, which, of course, is one of the most central questions of uh, sociology. Uh, uh, or uh, I looked at the Book of Certitude and I could not believe that the greatest, the, the highest achievement of Hegel and Marx, which is their historical consciousness, mm -hmm. and a sort of dialectical worldview, namely looking at everything as a process, as development, um, that what we have is becoming, not, not being. There is no being, but what we have is constant trans transformation of being mm. into nothingness and nothingness into being, namely becoming. Becoming is real. Everything is historical. Everything is changing and so on. Everything is dialectical. And uh, now I saw that the entire book of certitude is affirmation of this concept of, I mean, I mean, among other concepts, but the central issue is this historical consciousness. But, but I knew that both Marx and Hegel have limited this historical consciousness. This dialectics, for instance, did not apply to the realm of religion. For Hegel, Jesus was the last prophet, the last truth on religion. After that, there is none. And for Marx, religion is, in general, superstition and illusions, and therefore, there is no relevance of dialectics uh, 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 about it. But also in terms of society or history, for Hegel, dialectics or this change ends with his time. Uh, and so in Prussian state, he would realize the ultimate freedom. So it's the end of this okay. march of history. Mm -hmm. And in Marx, communism, which he thinks is... Um, Imminent. Soon it is going to be Once there's realized, a revolution and everyone's living in, in communes and sharing the wealth, every problem is then resolved, it's, all, it's all going to be fixed. And it is the last stage of development of humanity. And it's paradise, yeah. So it's you don't go from communism to some other mm -hmm. stage and so on. So in both of them, that historical consciousness, which is really the greatest, most important achievement of both these theories, Hegelian, dialectic, and Marxian, uh, there is historical consciousness, but historical consciousness becomes aborted. Mm -hmm. And now I was seeing that the Book of Certitude, um, written by a person uh, in Baghdad, exiled from Iran and so on, that uh, this historical consciousness becomes uh, uh, infinite. He applies it also to the realm of the Word of God, also to the realm of religion. So what mm -hmm. normally is perceived to be absolute, he makes it historical and dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, also for him, there is no end to this. There is no end to this dialectical transformation, uh, improvement, movement towards infinity and so So anyway, uh, these were among things that uh, totally was uh, shocking, unexpected for me. And that was the moment that created a sense of humility with regard to the Baha'i faith mm. in my mind. Mm. Previously, you know, I knew what it is, and I knew that, oh, it's, it's beautiful, but it's not sophisticated, so was, was it and purely, it changed. Was it purely the ideas, uh, and you saw the, the larger themes and uh, sociological themes underlying those work, seeing them through new eyes? Is, is that solely what brought you to a kind of humility before the writings of the Baha'i faith, or was there anything else that... <laughs> It, uh, this is a very um, perceptive uh, uh, question. 
Um, I'm a pretty in... perceptive guy. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And I have seen you in different uh, contexts and, uh, and I confirm that. But, uh, you know, in general, I'm, uh, I'm more intellectual type. And so this aspect was very important for me and continues to be important for me. But as you guessed, it was not just this, uh, this cognitive, this intellectual orientation. There were two other events happening at the same time, but they are more personal. So I just refer to them, but I don't elaborate on them, which were... Uh... We can get really personal here, by the way. <laughs> as much as you but want to share. Already the so listeners far, love I have been the very personal, personal stuff. <laughs> yes. They love the personal spiritual journey, you know, behind the great Baha'i thinkers and, and movers and shakers. Well, the first uh, element was... Uh, witnessing the steadfastness of the Baha'is of Iran. Mm. Um, this is the time that uh, a clerical theocracy has become dominant in Iran and because of its ignorance and because of its uh, paranoia and partly because of its uh, very acute understanding uh, that uh, Baha'i faith represents uh, modern humanitarian, egalitarian, progressive ideas. For all these reasons, one of the main uh, purpose and goals of this uh, clerical theocracy was elimination of the Baha'i faith from Iran. I mean, they wanted to exterminate Baha'i faith uh, from Iran, and still this is uh, but at that time, it was policy. especially egregious. They were lining them up in front of firing squads, and, exactly. and national spiritual assemblies were just being disappeared one after as soon as they could elect them, one after another. Yes. At first, you know, during that time, the ideas that these clerics had uh, was that uh, the Baha'i faith is uh, is not that important or powerful in the hearts of the people by itself. It's just these Baha'i leaders, these Baha'i intellectuals, they are the problems. And therefore, if we remove the level of the leadership mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the intellectuals, all other ranks- Cut off the and head file, and, the, and the body will die. Exactly, they would convert, they would become Muslim and so on. So uh, they, they looked at it as something external. Mm -hmm. It's always like that uh, whenever- it's the same way that we would fight a terrorist organization, like, oh, if we'll, we'll cut off the head and the, the leaders and that will do the Exactly, damage. exactly. And if, if it is the case that this, this terrorist uh, uh, organization is based upon a culture and an ideology which has influenced the hearts and minds of the people, then that would not be an effective uh, solution. In this case, uh, it was uh, the normal justification of the clerics to find some excuses why the Baha'i faith is so successful in attracting people uh, in the case of Iran to this, uh, to this cause. And so from the very beginning, they did not want to acknowledge the fact that uh, it's either the words of God or it's ideas which fits the time and therefore they become attractive. And so in order to... Uh, conceal or deny the real cause of the uh, appeal of the Baha'i faith, they would try to create all these external uh, explanations. For example, that uh, the Baha'is have a medicine they put in the tea of the people, and so when they give they offer tea to the people. They're drugging the people at fire exactly. sites. Exactly. <laughs> and they, <laughs> not really, that was, yeah. that was the, the popular explanation. We could idea. use some of that, uh, some of that <laughs> tincture here in the United States these days. <laughs> uh, or uh, later on, of course, political explanations become uh, uh, appealing to the uh, clerics. In the entire 20th century, not a single person, enemies of the Baha'i faith, including the clerics who were the leaders of this opposition, ever mentioned this idea that Babis or Baha'is uh, have a, a route which is outside of Iran or they are political. None of this. None ex there is no one who would say something like that. 
But it is in 1930s and 1940s that the political consciousness of colonialism, imperialism, and so on becomes a normal pattern of thinking of Iranians at this time. Then it is at this time that they come and now define the Baha'i faith uh, as a political event. So it is the foreigners who are helping the Baha'is. So if the Baha'i faith becomes successful, it's because outsiders are helping. Sure. It's, it's a, always external. It's always been either the Russians or the English or exactly. the Americans or the Israelis. And so uh, they thought that if they kill the Baha'i leaders, Baha'i intellectuals and so on, the question, the Baha'i problem would be resolved. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why they were killing all these intellectuals. But how does this relate to you? So you're there at that time and you, you witnessed some of these acts of bravery, of heroism, of sacrifice of Baha'is that you knew personally during this time? Uh, yes, of course, many of them uh, have been people that uh, I knew them personally. Uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, the persecutions became uh, universal. So, um, for example, anybody who was working in Iran in any way related to government, which because of the oil, you know, um, uh, perhaps 50 to 60 percent of the jobs were directly or indirectly related to the uh, government, they would all would be fired. And if they were already um, retired, their retirement salary would be cut off unless they recant and write that they are Baha'i, that, that they are Muslim, yeah. yes. And so uh, they, uh, what I was uh, looking was not only this heroic steadfastness of these Baha'is, they would not go to the TV like almost every other groups, including Marxist groups. Marxist leaders all went to the TV and said, in order We're to Muslim. confess yeah. that they are spies of foreign governments and, and, and now they are repenting and they are becoming good Muslims and so on. All those people who... Those cowardly Marxists. <laughs> all, and it's interesting that the Marxist, Marxist leaders who were doing this, they were the ones who were also writing, like everybody else at that time in Iran, uh, against the Baha'is and criticizing mm. the Baha'is and so on. And now those same people, of course, would, would join the, the uh, uh, flood of the repenters uh, that they were. But Baha'is were the ones who were not doing that. I knew a number of people who were martyred. But also at the personal level, I saw all these uh, in my own family. My father, who passed away um, almost uh, a year and a half ago, um, he was uh, a very kind man. He was a, a, a very low rank uh, uh, police officer, um, <clears throat> and he was retired years before revolution. Uh -huh. uh, and the, in general, I love that your dad was a cop. That's that's so funny. I can't, exactly. I can't picture that yeah. you have a dad who's a was, cop. Uh, he was <laughs> very good in communication with people, and uh, he was uh, very good in writing. Mm -hmm. And so his position was office position, really. Okay. That he would write reports and so on. That was his administrator. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and uh, everybody loved him. Um, uh, he was a very in interesting man. Uh, but in any case, my father, I re always remember, was a very practical man. And because we didn't have much money, so he always uh, had this idea of life and society and so on as, as uh, cruel and unkind, that if you are uh, in a situation of financial difficulty and so on, nobody would help. So it, it was... Uh, um, on anything related to these financial questions and so on, this pessimistic need for self-reliance and so on was, was very important for him. And uh, for that reason, when revolution happened, and now I am not in Iran, I'm in the United mm -hmm. States and so on, I knew that he was asked just to sign a written document 
So he was not expected to go to the TV and it was not going to be published anywhere. It was a very secret thing. This anonymous just writing that he's no longer Baha'i and he's a Muslim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had the assumption that because he is no, you know, very practical person and he had no other, uh, other source of financial income. Uh, uh, income except that uh, retirement salary, then you know nobody would know. Uh, and he was very practical, so he he would he would sign that nobody would know. That that was the assumption that I had about my own father. I loved my father, and I knew how. Uh, beloved he is and but I I thought that this this is his one aspect of his personality and I was totally surprised when I saw that like a mountain you know he stood and he refused to sign that and therefore his retirement salary was completely cut off and he didn't think even for one second what would be the consequences and so on. right uh, these sort of things uh, the same thing happened to my sister. Uh, but all over me, I would see this heroism, which was not just in the form of you know, one person to be martyred and so on. And this also challenged, not only made me respect Baha'is in general and Baha'i faith much more, but also challenged a very cynical idea that I had developed in the past. Because the Baha'is, do not participate in partisan politics, and they don't use uh, violence for revolution or change of the society mm -hmm. and so on. I had this assumption during those Marxist times that the reason that Baha'is actually do not participate in politics and so on is that it is safe. Mm -hmm. And so in Iran, for example, they did not participate in politics because they, they wanted security and, and safety. It mm -hmm. was to their self-interest. It was almost cowardice in some ways. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so that was also one of the reasons that I became attracted to Marxism that, you know, emphasizes political action directly, uh, uh, political participation in events and so on, challenges and so on. Um, and now looking at the form of a new state in Iran, which was this clerical theocracy, Mm -hmm. And the reaction of the Baha'is, I saw that now they act on the basis of that same principle, even though the consequence of this principle is willingness to sacrifice everything. Ah. And so I came to realize that it was not selfishness uh, and it was not desire for security, but it was rather this inner um, commitment to values, to universal principles, to nonviolence, uh, which animated the behavior of this community and so on. So uh, this was one of the other things that changed me and my approach. And so when Baha'u'llah says, let deeds, not words, be your adorning, in a way it was seeing the teachings in action in your fellow Baha'is, in the Baha'is of your family, in the Baha'is of your homeland, that um, allowed you to see, oh, there must be something more to this than just, than just words. Yes. I mean, at that time, it just challenged a number of stereotypical ideas that I had, mm -hmm. easy ideas to not to take seriously Baha'is and Baha'i faith. Uh, those stereotypical ideas started to crumble. And also my respect for the Baha'is and Baha'i faith increased. But I didn't completely realize the significance of all these things. And still, you know, I'm trying to understand. Gradually, I discovered how fundamental and foundational and significant and, and filled with meanings um, these aspects of the Baha'i faith is. Um, but it was enough to, um, to transform me to become ready uh, to read and consider and so on. When you have too much pride, when you are, you know that you know everything. Yeah. And that's one of the, the veil of knowledge. problems of uh, Marxist theory in particular. Mm -hmm. you, you 
end, of, end of secular academia. Exactly. You know that you have discovered the laws of every, everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that uh, reason, if you know everything, then these religious groups or these religious ideologies or these mystical ideas and so on, they have nothing to, to offer because you already know everything. Were there the any... moment you start to know that this pride mm -hmm. starts to, uh, to crack and to be questioned and so on, then um, this is the moment that the possibility of search of the truth becomes uh, real. Did you have, as Oprah would say, an aha moment? Was there uh, anything in the holy writings of the Bab or Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha at that time? Do you remember any word or phrases or, or teaching or um, a holy writing that just popped out and this touched you in your heart or helped tip the scale? Um at that time, there was no uh, no specific one. I mean, the, the, as I mentioned, Book of Certitude and mm -hmm. Secret of Divine Civilization in general and their message and so on. Um, and of course, you should uh, remember that I had studied Baha'i writings. So many of these quotations that particularly later on becomes so significant for me, maybe I, I even knew them by heart, but mm. I would not understand their their import, their significance mm -hmm. in, in the past. However, I had a moment, and that's, that is the other personal aspect of the story, which I would be very short about it, that um, there was a Sure, you'll be long on Marxist theory, but you'll be <laughs> short on the personal story. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was in uh, Virginia uh, at this time. I was uh, uh, teaching... Uh, uh, at University of uh, Virginia Charlottesville, mm -hmm. um, and during th that uh, semester, uh, I uh, uh, I had all these spiritual struggles, and I was constantly thinking about these sort of issues and so on. And then, uh, for a few nights, I had some strange dreams. And in the center of these dreams was one of the martyrs, and I don't want to mention who and what and so on. Uh, one of these mart martyrs that I had tremendous respect for, for him. And so this, uh, these dreams and the interaction that I had in these uh, dreams uh, with this particular martyr, that was the moment that uh, I define myself as a Baha'i. Mm. And so I remember the days following that, everything looked different. It was as if I am literally born for the first time in the world. Everything was new. I mean, light had a different sense for mm. me. The mm. trees were... I mean, everything was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. Everything was expressed a sense of joy. Um, and I wish that that had continued uh, <laughs> in my life. How long uh, did that last? Just a couple of days, or did you, did you coast on that it, for weeks or months? I don't remember the details, but it should have been um, less than a month, mm -hmm. um, but more than a week, definitely. And uh, so the combination of these, the previous things were building up. Mm -hmm. And with these uh, personal dreams and so on, I, uh, I, I didn't need to make a decision. Uh -huh. I mean, it was a reality. And from yeah. then on, skepticism or search and so on was replaced by the idea of continuing independent investigation of truth, but within the context of uh, knowing the significance uh, of the Baha'i writings and writings of Baha'u'llah. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful story. Thanks so much for sharing it. So I'm going to jump ahead. Now, Dr. Saidi, the, uh, you've written a great deal on the works of the Bab. Uh, I believe that you've read every piece of writing by the Bab. Is that correct? Uh, Every piece of uh, writing of the Bob which exists right now, yes. <laughs> so are you saying someone might find one somewhere, like in a in a suitcase in a basement in 
Tabriz somewhere or something? Uh, I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> we know, for example, that, uh, I mean, a classic case, a number of tablets of, Baha- of, of the Bab, when uh, he was uh, on the way of uh, Mecca and Medina, uh, was uh, stolen. Mm. And uh, the possibility that they would be found, and we know exactly what they are, because Bob, in a number of his works, gives the list of these writings, which oh. was uh, stolen. It, uh, they were very uh, important for the Bob. Bob, you know, partly uh, because he was aware of the uniqueness and the uh, historical character of his life and his writings, and partly perhaps because he he used to be a merchant when he was very, very young. Yes. Between the age of maybe 16 and 20, he was uh, an independent businessman. He had his own they shop. They called him so. the merchant prophet. I know <laughs> that the government officials call, used to call him the merchant prophet. Um, so taking journals and taking notes and accounting and so on, it was one aspect of that merchant experience. Like keeping and so a ledger. On. Uh-huh. Yes. And so he applied this to the case of his writings. Hmm. So a number of times he wrote tablets, and the basic point of these tablets was to give the list of the writings that he has revealed up to that point. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that, that was... An, but you have, an, read, you have read everything extant. Yes, I mean, the And some, the some greatest, you've described on, that are handwritten on little pieces of paper that he must have written in Maku or Shirik. Right in in prison, perhaps. I mean, it has gone through different uh, stages, and uh, um, it's one of the unique characteristics of this uh, uh, stage of uh, religious development that we have uh, the authoritative, uh, authentic, uh, revealed writings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, mm-hmm. and uh, of course Haifa and the Baha'i archives is the supreme place that all these things are found. And to some extent, uh, we owe it to the guardian uh, because he was the one who made sure that Baha'is, if they have original tablets of any of the sacred Mm -hmm. figures and so on, to send uh, send them uh, or copies of them and so on to the uh, Baha'i archives and the and this uh, became the, the greatest mm. uh, source of, uh, of these writings and so on. But in terms of the Bob, um, we have different stages. Uh, when he was for more than three years in uh, mountains of Azerbaijan, in Maku and Chehrir, uh, he had uh, uh, a person, which was one of the letters of the living, Sayyid Hussein, um, and uh, uh, so he, wa- he, he was his secretary. And so vast majority of the tablets that he, that he has revealed during this time, they are written by the revelation writing, namely mm-hmm. fast type of writing. And all those originals, we have them. They, they are available wow. in Haifa. Uh, but for example, there were times that uh, the Bob was, for example, in Esfahan. Bob was um, in Esfahan for six months. And out of these six months, most of it, he was secretly there. Namely, the governor pretended that he had sent him to Tehran, but in fact, he brought him back, wow. and he was in the house of the, uh, of the governor. And so during most of those times of Esfahan, it seems that there was no particular secretary. And so everything, almost everything that he has written during the uh, Esfahan, all of them, even the revelation writing, is with his own handwriting. Oh. And the, almost all of them are with a blue ink. Mm. And many of them on a sort of blue uh, paper. Mm. Uh, but uh, um, very beautiful. You know, the, Bob, whenever he wanted to send something uh, which was expression of of uh, his confirmation and his love for some of his special disciples, uh, he would uh, write something with his beautiful handwriting and send them. Mm-hmm. But this was a sort of 
calligraphy that he he would write it uh, you know take time that mm -hmm. uh, he, like a the piece of artwork would, almost. yes but usually but, a pre-existing piece of writing that he would put into calligraphy no, form no, or no, a new usually new piece? He, he would create something oh, new okay. and many times uh, they were in the form of either, either a temple uh like a pentagon mm -hmm. like uh, or in the form of a circle or even when he would write just um, a letter it won't be a set of parallel uh, lines but it would have different designs and so it would be an artistic work um, but when for example he was in Esfahan he was writing he, there was no secretary so when the revelation was coming and it was fast and so he's writing on proof of for instance special prophethood something like that or a commentary on surah of Val Asr, which is one of the surahs of the Quran he, he writes a company uh, so he has to write fast and he has to write it himself so the writing is one of these fast Mm -hmm. uh, uh, writing, uh, sort of revelation writing, uh, but it is again with his own, and this, of course, writing is different from those calligraphic type and so mm -hmm. on, but mm -hmm. it still it is uh, beautiful and you can read it much easier mm. than the handwriting, revelation writings of his uh, secretary. Uh, right, right. Uh, his is much more, uh, much more clear. Interesting. Well, we could go into the life of the Bab, the work of the Bab, the writings of the Bab, of which you are the foremost scholar. Um, but maybe we could save that for another discussion, because I would love to have you back on the show. Would you Would you agree <laughs> right here and now to come back on? Yes, of course. It would be my honor. Oh, thank you. Um, and um, I'll cook you lunch. And <laughs> But as we're getting to the bicentennial of the birth of Baha'u'llah, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now and what... What are your thinking? Where is your line of thinking about the work of Baha'u'llah, this very special, spiritually charged time? What's new for you and what's kind of sticking out for you right now about the work of Baha'u'llah? Uh, at this time, I mean, the most uh, important uh, internal event which is happening for me is uh, that uh, I am reading a lot of writings of Baha'u'llah, original writings of Baha'u'llah that has uh, never been available really and they are now these are everything that i'm reading now is available online not translated though uh, in uh, arabic and farsi vast vast majority are not translated and they are not published also in persian or arabic so most of these tablets are tablets that i'm reading them for the first time are they I just mean, like copied to pdf and then been put online or you something? see or, yes i mean scanned and like put online yes what happened uh, was that uh, before iranian uh, revolution the uh, national spiritual assembly of iran decided to uh, create uh, about 100 uh, volumes of uh, works, majority of them are sacred writings, uh, to make sure that uh, they would be protected and uh, they won't be destroyed. And, and they made a number of copies of these and, and sent it to different places. Mm. They're usually famous in English as INBA, INBA, Iran National Baha'i Archive or something like mm. that. And the uh, they are 100 volumes. Some of them are not sacred writings, but majority are writings of the Bab, writings of Baha'u'llah, writings of Abdul Baha. Mm -hmm. And so about maybe 30 uh, out of these 100 are writings of Baha'u'llah. These are different manuscripts that um, people have had in, uh, in their possessions. And uh, of course, a copy has been sent to the World Center um, but uh, uh, but now they would look at the uh, original, compare it with the, with the uh, copy, and when they confirm the correspondence between these copies and so on, it becomes one of these 100 volumes. And so they sent it to different parts of the world to make sure that if uh, some of them would be 
destroyed, they would be protected. Mm -hmm. And uh, now um, a number of uh, websites uh, have, uh, they are not formally Baha'i websites, but they are by the Baha'is, uh, which are uh, making available online all these works. Mm. So a lot of writings of Baha'u'llah that previously was not uh, available to me myself, uh, like anybody else, uh, I'm now um, I'm now reading them. So these are actually very exciting times for me um, because uh, I'm trying to understand uh, Baha'u'llah's writings in its totality and so on. And so mm. it's creating a different universe for me. What's, but at the what's, same sticking, time, what's sticking out for you? What are, what, are, what are you finding? I mean, we have such a such a small amount that have been published and such a smaller yes. amount that have been published and translated into English. And then I was recently in Iceland and then they even have a smaller amount of the English stuff that's been translated into Icelandic. So we just have a, just a small fraction. I, f I forget what that amount is, but it's, it's, a, it's a very, yeah. very small amount. I mean, of course, the number of the Baha'u'llah's writings which are translated in English are are uh, significant, you know. Uh, previous dispensations, they had just, at the most, one work associated sure. with mm -hmm. Prophet. Now, Book of Certitude is translated. I mean, Epistle to the Son of the Wolf is translated. We have gleanings, which are uh, uh, reflections mm -hmm. of varieties of tablets of Baha'u'llah, seven valleys, four valleys. Mm -hmm. The letters to words, the kings uh, and rulers. Exactly. Yes. Uh, gems of divine mysteries. Oh, you could spend your whole life just reading what's already been exactly. translated. So, I mean, it's not the case but it's that the tip we don't of the have. But exactly, you're right. And uh, to be honest with you, um, every day I am finding uh, new, exciting things. Uh, so give us, give us some, <laughs> give us some nibbles, um, some tidbits. Well, one, I just discuss one little thing uh, about this. And this is one aspect that uh, is important for me to be conveyed somehow because 200 years ago, Baha'u'llah was, uh, was born. And I feel that in this year, whatever I do, somehow should be connected to introducing Baha'u'llah to the world. Mm. And so this is the central issue for, for me and whatever I do right now. Um, one uh, element that I am discovering by looking at uh, all these uh, writings is uh, the significance of the first experience of revelation um, in Siachal uh, dungeon, in Tehran dungeon by Baha'u'llah, which is the occasion of the birth of, of Baha'i faith. Uh, so Baha'u'llah hears this uh, statement. The beginning of that uh, is that verily we shall render thee victorious by thyself and by thy pen. Mm -hmm. And then continues, if you will. But that's the beginning and, and the heart of the whole statement. And what I'm discovering is that Everything in the writings of Baha'u'llah, all his teachings, all his ideas, in a sense, are present here. And, and this has a, a double significance. One is that you, one understands that this statement is so rich. I mean, it seems just one very simple, uh, straightforward mm -hmm. statement. Uh, but when you look at all writings of Baha'u'llah, all teachings of Baha'u'llah as emanations and expressions, as unfolding mm -hmm. of this central point, uh, it takes a very different uh, sense. And the second point is that you understand that everything that Baha'u'llah was discussing throughout his 40 years of revelation from you know, 1852, which is this experience in the Sea of Charles, to 1892, that he passes away, it's 40 years of revelation, that everything that he is discussing at different stages of his revelation already are present in his consciousness from the very beginning. Uh -huh. It's not the case that through interaction with society, going to different places and so on, 
So his mind becomes influenced by different situations and therefore new ideas would come into him and, and so on. Right, like a regular scholar would, over the course of their career, you could track 40 years of writing, of your writing, for instance, <laughs> and you, there would be a shift in your writing exactly. from when you started to later, exactly. things that you had learned and things that you were thinking about. Yes. But, so you're saying with that emanation, that point of, that point of revelation, the, the spark of the maid of heaven, that he, he, it's like the Big Bang. It was yes. all the ingredients Everything were there, there, all the molecules, all the, yes. all the heat and the energy and the atoms were all present. Yes. And so gradually you see that these are developing, these are manifesting themselves, but it's a question of manifestation. And then I was so surprised to find a number of the writings of Baha'u'llah in which he explicitly identifies all these different ideas that he has from universal peace to, uh, I don't know, um, one universal auxiliary language uh, to the necessity of uh, consultation and democratization. I mean, all these ideas which at first might appear to be unconnected, you know, different things and so mm -hmm. He relates them all as the principle of render, rendering the cause of God victorious. Uh, which is going to take place through pen uh, and uh, through the character, mm -hmm. uh, uh, either of the prophet or of, of the Baha'is. Because immediately after that statement, uh, Baha'u'llah is given the promise that a new race of men would be raised, uh, that they would render the cause of God victorious. And so... In this statement, for instance, originally you see that God is engaged in making the cause of God victorious. Verily, we shall render thee victorious. God is going to make, to mm -hmm. make victorious. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, God makes victorious through Baha'u'llah, through being of Baha'u'llah and pen of Baha'u'llah, this victory is going to take place. We shall render thee victorious by thyself and by thy pen. Mm -hmm. So... God is engaged in this act of uh, aiding, rendering victorious the cause uh, of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah is doing that, and immediately Baha'u'llah is given the promise that a new race of human beings would be emerged who would engage in assisting the God and, and rendering the cause of God victorious. So this is something that human being, Baha'u'llah, and God all merge into one action. This, this is something that binds them together, which is the fundamental principle of Baha'i faith, namely that all beings are reflections of divine. And so Baha'u'llah sees in human beings uh, this uh, trust of God, this image of God, which has to be unveiled. And that's why this new religion has nothing to do with violence or with the sword but it has to, to do something with pen, with consciousness, pen. Mm. words. Mm -hmm. And of course, with loving character, mm. loving deeds, transformation of personality and so on, so that one becomes the image of God, not potentially, mm. but in, uh, in reality. The idea is that human being also from that moment is defined not as a member of a jungle, in which violence and struggle for existence and the, uh, and the beastly conduct and so on, coercion becomes relevant. Human being now is defined as a spiritual being. Ah. And now this definition of human being as a spiritual being has to become the basis of civilization, the basis ah. of the new culture, the mm. society. And so the concept of universal peace, for example, that later on, you know, he emphasizes through his letters to the uh, kings and leaders of the world and so on, already is present in rejection of the sword, rejection of the violence as mm -hmm. the means of uh, assisting. And the rejection, of uh, as you said at the very beginning, rejection of slavery early on, exactly. because how could one spiritual being subject another spiritual being? to be in a lesser station. Yes. Uh, so um, you're completely right. And that's why in uh, one of his early writings of Baha'u'llah, 
he writes this beautiful prayer in which he outlaws slavery. This is long time before Kitab Aqdas to outlaw slavery. And his basic point, and it's interesting, he outlaws slavery in the form of prayer. So he's talking to God. And the reason is that for him, the reason slavery is not acceptable is the spiritual character of human beings. Because we are all servants of God, therefore none of us are superior to the other. Yeah. We are, this humility of all of us before God makes mm -hmm. of all of us are, are slaves and servants, mm -hmm. but servants of God. But at the same time, that fact makes us all of us noble makes us all of us endowed with rights. Mm. So because we are servants of God, we are reflections of divine attributes. And so everybody becomes sacred and beautiful. And for that reason, commodification of human beings, reducing humans to the level of objects so that a human being can be owned by another human right. being becomes impossible. So, And then to go further long, than that, uh, prejudice against another human being for their skin color or for their gender or for their class uh, is an impossibility as well because we're all spiritual beings. And if we're living in that spiritual truth that we're spiritual noble beings, how could we ever assert ourselves above anyone else in any other way? Yes. And the, all of these are rooted in that original statement in which human being is defined as a spiritual being uh, who has to directly recognize God and his spiritual values. So you cannot, religion is not something that by coercion and use of the sword or violence and so on, you create a culture by force. Now it's a culture that has to come from the hearts of the people. Mm. It's the domain that Baha'u'llah is going to rule from now on. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has the a responsibility of independently searching and independently being persuaded. And this suddenly makes all people as noble, as endowed with rights, as equal. And so anything which would define humans, human beings as animals, as objects, mm -hmm. uh, uh, become uh, contradictory to, to, to this new uh, worldview and so on. So this is just one example of a general uh, point that I have been uh, blessed to, to witness and recognize. Mm. That is the continuity of Baha'u'llah's revelation. And that one little statement like, verily we shall render thee victorious by thyself and by thy pen, which at first, you know, we read it a hundred times pretty minor. and yeah, we think yeah. that we, we know what it is. Right. And now I'm getting much better this feeling uh, that the words of God, you know, have these oceans of meanings yeah. that uh, we should be very humble with regard to the word of God. The, uh, the last podcast I did was with uh, a brilliant uh, Native American artist, uh, musician, dancer, teacher, Kevin Locke. And he talked about in the Native American tradition, the idea that there is a spiritual reality and this physical world is a, is a reflection of that, an emanation of that. So when you look at an eagle soaring, and if a Native American is worshiping an eagle soaring, they're not worshiping that actual eagle in the sky. They're worshiping the, the spiritual metaphor behind the, the beauty and nobility of that eagle soaring and that our role as spiritual beings on this planet is to protect these kind of be guardians of these beautiful metaphors because we're living in this world of metaphor this world of emanation yes and that's uh, that's completely um, compatible with uh, uh, with the writings of baha'u'llah when you read him he's constantly saying that every atom of existence right now is in joy is dancing and is engage in act of witnessing and praising this day of God. And he says that it's only humans who have created so much veils uh, <laughs> in front of their eyes. I mean, they have constructed yes. all these artificial veils and so on. So they can't hear these things. They can't see these things. And, uh, 
and so for him, all reality is spiritual, and all reality is is excited and is happy and is expressing this new spiritual spring. Uh, it just humans uh, have to make sure that they would use their eyes and they would use their ears. I mean, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. And all of this is because of the veils that artificial we have created. Mm. So for Baha'u'llah, actually, truth is not so difficult. If you look, you would see. Right. But it's that we have artificially have created all these veils. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the beginning of um, hidden words or the beginning of Book of Certitude, it emphasizes purification of heart mm. in order for knowledge to, to take mm. place. The veils mm. should be questions and torn. Um, otherwise, for Baha'u'llah, all beings, it's not that we have a material world opposed to a spiritual world. All beings are spiritual, and all beings are now engaged in this loving, joyful expression of the uh, spiritual renewal uh, centered on concept of unity uh, and peace. It's just we humans also have to open our eyes and see that. It's beautiful. Dr. Saidi, it's been such a pleasure. We've been talking for a good long while, and I feel like I could talk for another eight hours with you. I hope that you'll come back on the show, and maybe we can do a deep dive into the life and writings of the Bob next time. But uh, this was just such a beautiful overview of your thinking and life and philosophy, and I just can't thank you enough. for. Thank you so much, Rain. It, uh, it was a very delightful experience for me, and I'll be very happy and honored to participate again. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. So long. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much and good night.